What happened to it? I don't see my the little insect there, but who knows? Huh? All right, welcome to Seattle, Washington, to the Seward Park Audubon Center. Uh, my name is Ed Dominguez, the lead naturalist at the center, and we'll be starting our program in just a few moments on the incredible world of the Corbett family. It's a blustery evening here in Seattle with a gorgeous sunset. And I was just look, out looking out the window and the strong southwest breeze that's coming in from the low pressure system off of our coast was creating an air surf. And our crows were doing acrobatical tricks, loops, barrel rolls, and just surfing the air, having a great time. And we'll talk more about crows and their amazing capacity to enjoy life with play. So in just a few minutes, we'll begin. I'd like to invite you to, if you have a smart TV, to uh, watch this on the YouTube app in your smart TV, and you can sit back on your couch with a nice drink and enjoy rather than sitting around a computer. And in just a few moments, we'll begin. Okay, well, hopefully you are all settled in. One of my favorite groups of birds are the corvids. Corvids because they're in the family Corvidae. And this includes, as you see here, the ravens, the crows, the jays, the magpies. And tonight I'd like to give you an introduction to this incredible world of birds by first describing each of the bird species we have in the corvid family that are here in Washington state, and then focusing in on the in incredible intelligence of these birds. These birds are right up there with whales and dolphins and just below primates. You and me in terms of their bird function. And the uh, University of Washington has done many studies, has also written many, authored many books had many PBS uh, specials on corvids. We'll be meeting John and seeing a little video segment of him later in the program. And then I'm gonna show you some of the incredible ways that crows interact with their world, solving puzzles, uh, enjoying themselves playing, and even making friends with animals that you might not think crows would become friends with. So again, welcome, I'm Ed Dominguez speaking to you from Seward Park Audubon Center on the shores of Lake Washington here in Seattle, Washington. So let's begin with the Corvid family and the incredible knowledge of our Corvids. And if I can get my clicker to work. Just a little technical glitch here. There we go. 
Of course, I want to acknowledge the original inhabitants of this area, the Coast Salish peoples, in particular here on Lake Washington, they refer to themselves as the Hachu Abish, or the inside people, inside from the salt water. They're the original stewards of these lands and we pay homage and respect to them. It's the original conservationists of this place we now call home. And the Corbett family were very important to the Coast Salish peoples. In fact, <clears throat> ravens were often included in their origin of the earth stories as the, the being that created the earth. They also were regarded as uh, beings of great intelligence and cunning and uh, of religious importance. They occupied many of, the, many of the same attributes that interior uh, indigenous peoples uh, conferred to foxes, being very clever, very smart, and very, very adept at making a living and solving problems. So the Corvid family were very important to the Coast Salish peoples. So I mentioned our Corvids are members of the Crow and Jay family, family Corvidae. So let's meet. Who are our Corvid? We have the Ravens group. Next, we have the Crows, and we have the Jays and the Magpies. These groups of birds round out our North American birds, and we're going to focus in particularly tonight on the Corvids that are here in Washington State. So let's meet our Corvids. Let's start with the most common one, the American Crow. Corvus bracarincos, which means with a short nose because the bill isn't as big as a raven's. You know, many people, when they think of crows, have a not too positive perspective on them. A few years ago, I remember hearing one of our radio personalities here in Seattle talking about, why shouldn't it be legal to just shoot them? They just make a ruckus and caw and poop and torment other animals and steal food because there's so many of them, they are raucous. They do vocalize a lot. They tend to be viewed as pests and problems and people view them with a bit of disdain. But once you discover how incredibly intelligent these birds are and have an idea as to what these behaviors that they're exhibiting mean, it adds a whole new perspective on this very, very incredible bird. So let's take a look at this American crow. Number one, it has a slender straight beak in contrast to the raven that we'll see in a few minutes. It's got a smooth throat profile. You'll notice the throat is very smooth. There's no feathers that are sticking out. Nice rounded head. And it's a medium to medium size, medium large size bird, generally somewhere between 16 to 19 inches long. And you can see that it's mostly black, has black eyes, black beak, black legs, but you can see a little bit of iridescence in those feathers on the wings. And I have a video coming that will give you a sense of when you're in the right light, the crow isn't just black, it can reflect a great variety of colors. So here we have a crow for food at the beach, crows of Puget Sound. You look at the different colors that you can see from iridescence, so refraction of the light going through the feather barbules. Crows looking for invertebrates, annelids, which are worms, small fish, water plants. Crows are omnivorous. They're opportunistic turn over rocks, we've got a little isopod there. And they're always seem to be thinking. So our American crow. Now let's contrast that with the bird that is most often confused with the crow and the one that I most often get questions. How can you tell a raven from a crow? Well, here we have the common raven, Corvus corax, 
Corvus is the Roman term for raven. So we're going way back to ancient Roman days for the name of this bird. And as we'll see, there are a few differences, even though they both look like black birds with black eyes, black legs, and a black, black beak. Let's take a look at some of the differences. This is a larger bird, medium to large size, often two feet in length. So it's a bigger, and you can see the whole body look is heavier. It's more solid. There's more substance to it than a crow. And if we take a close look at the head of the raven, we'll see some distinctive differences that can, can help you tell the difference between crows and ravens. First of all, ravens have well-developed nasal bristles. These function just like nose hairs in, in us human beings to help keep dust, particulate matter, out of the bird's nasal passages. So they don't get stopped up, don't get infections, and helps keep them clean. Ravens have quite large and lengthy ones that cover almost half the length of the bill, whereas crows are much shorter and not nearly as noticeable. Secondly, the beak of the raven is much thicker. The top part of the beak, the culmen, is rounded. And if you'll notice the difference in size between the upper part of the beak and the lower, the upper beak occupies more space, the lower part of the beak is thinner. With the upper and lower parts of the beak and sometimes even look like they're sticking out from, from the throat, as though the crow, the raven hasn't had a shave for a while. So here's our raven's profile from the side, and you can see the differences. Now, I have a video for you that will show some differences of ravens and crows in flight, differences in their tail shape, differences in their vocalizations, and differences you can see even when the birds are perched. So let's take a little deeper look at how can you tell a crow from a raven? The easiest ways to tell a raven from a crow. Crows are smaller and weigh between one and two pounds. They usually have a wingspan between 32 and 40 inches. Common ravens weigh closer to three pounds and have wingspans of 46 to 54 inches. Crows are louder and lead towards a harsh caw. Ravens are softer and make more of a soft rock. Crows rock to caw. Ravens just rock. Crows generally appear more nervous, and when they land, they flit their tail and wing feathers. When ravens land, they tend to land in a more solid, stable manner. Probably the most common way to differentiate between crows and ravens is to watch them as they fly. Keep in mind the general size for the raven is larger and broader, but pay close attention to the tail. For a raven's tail usually has a wedge shape, and a crow's tail looks like it's been cut off. Unfortunately, when either bird is landing or putting the brakes on, their tails fan out and it's hard to tell at this stage. But keep watching, and when they relax again, you should be able to tell. One other quick telltale sign. If some of the birds happen to land close, note not just their size, but quickly focus in on the shape of the bird's bill. A crow's is sharper and shorter, with the top and the bottom portions closer to equal size. The raven's is more Roman or hooked, and the top portion is larger than the bottom. A crow, a raven, a crow, a raven. Also remember, ravens have the large throat hackles crows do not have. Crows also flap and yap most of the time when they're flying. A raven spends a lot of time quietly soaring. So in review, ravens rock. They are generally quieter and calmer. They have a wedge or a diamond-shaped tail, a larger beak and a beard, what are you doing? and ravens' wings whoosh. What, are you doing, huh? what do you see here?
here. If you said you saw a raven in the first scene and a crow in the second, you're right and ready for the wild. If you weren't sure, don't worry, you will. And in the next- So how did you do on that little quiz? When you see the birds in the air, the shape of the tail is very diagnostic. Again, the ravens have the diamond-shaped tail, think like a baseball diamond. Crows have a tail that's squared off at the end. And the nervous twitching of crows when they land is also indicative, whereas raven, ravens tend to be just more solid, more calm, more composed. Here in Seattle, we have much many more crows than we have ravens. Although here in Seward Park, I just heard a raven yesterday croaking, giving that guttural hur, hur, in the forest uh, right up behind the center. So we do have them around, but not nearly as prevalent as we do crows. If you go up into the Cascades or the Olympics though, up in the high country, you'll always see ravens up in that area. Because in Washington, they tend to like those higher elevation mountainous areas rather than they do the cities. So a little bit about crows and ravens and how you can tell the two apart. But who else do we have in the Corvid family? Let's take a look at this beautiful bird. I'm sure many of you, if you live in Seattle, have seen this bird in your yard. And this is the Stellar Jay. The Stellar Jay is a little smaller than a crow, but in terms of body, in terms of bulk, but in terms of body length, it's almost the same length. But it has this beautiful blue to indigo coloration. And then the head has the black that comes down like a cowl with a spiky hairdo, like he's got gel in the hair or a little bit of an attitude. And then if you notice on the front of the face, there are two beautiful blue marks right between the eyes and right above the bill. The Stellar's J was named after George Steller, a German scientist that was the first European scientist to uh, approach, if not quite reach, uh, the western coast of North America. I believe it was in the 1740s, 1741, well before George Vancouver sailed the HMS Discovery into, uh, uh, and, into uh, Puget Sound in 1792. He was coming over with um, a Danish captain named Bering, for whom the Bering Sea and the Bering Strait is named, but um, their ship had to turn back just before they got to the coast of Alaska, and they ended up having to, uh, they didn't quite make it back to Russia. They had to spend a winter on an island, and they were scurvy ridden, and it was a pretty tough time. Uh, captain Bering died, and uh, uh, George Steller finally made it back to Russia, but um, the experience so shook him that he turned to drink and uh, died an alcoholic and never made it back to Europe. So, but anyway, he was an important scientist and the Stellar's J is named after him. Let's take a look and a listen at the sounds of the Stellar's J. This is their harsh warning call or scolding call. They have another call. Very chatty, very noisy bird. You always know when they're around. Now listen to this. Sounds just like a red-tailed hawk. Jays are great mimics. I've been fooled many times thinking there's a red-tailed hawk nearby. And I look up into the sky, no hawk, and what do I see on a branch? A stellar jay. A dead ringer mimic for a red tail hawk. And this is just a few of the many varied sounds and vocalizations that jays can make. Same thing with crows and ravens. They have a very complex language that we'll talk about a little later in the presentation. Now, this 
beautiful bird. Used to be a rarity here in Washington state, but it's been becoming more common. This is the California scrub jay. And there was a time when the scrub, California scrub jays were south of the Columbia River. You could see them in California, of course. I grew up in Northern California. I saw these guys all the time. We called them blue jays back then until I learned what their real name was. Then they moved north into Oregon. Then they started crossing the Columbia River. Several years ago, when I first moved to Washington, it was very rare to see a California scrub jay. Then as the climate's gotten warmer and warmer, because these guys like it warm, they started becoming not common, but there were more reports of California scrub jays. And now, although they're not as common as the Stellar's jay, I have a couple that come in my backyard with the Stellar's jays and love, they love the peanuts in the shell that I put out for them. And there are many, many people report having California scrub jays. So they've gone from being a real exception, a real rarity, to being a, a more commonplace bird. And uh, they're gorgeous, beautiful colors, and are every bit as intelligent and wily as the uh, stellar jay. So they're a lot of fun to have around, and I think they're only going to become more prevalent in our area. Now, this is another a J family member we have, but this one you find up in the mountains, not here in the city. And this is called the Clark's Nutcracker, named after William Clark of the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1802 and 03, as they set out from St. Louis, Missouri to find a route to overland to the Pacific Ocean. It's called a nutcracker because one of its favorite foods are the seeds of a tree-lined species of pine we have here in Washington state, the white bark pine. Let's take a look at the Clark's nutcracker as he extracts his pine nuts from a white bark. That sharp bill is well suited for cracking open the resinous cones. White bark pine nuts are very important food for many animals. In grizzly country, Grizzly bears use this as their primary fall source for food and for fattening up for hibernation, along with berries. If the white bark pine cone crop fails, as it does some years, say in Idaho, Montana, grizzly bears end up needing food, will end up coming down out of the mountains and getting into trouble in uh, human inhabited areas because they need to have a certain caloric intake every day or else they won't be able to trigger their body's hibernation mechanism that allows them to go into the torpor for the winter. And if a bear can't sleep through the winter, there's not enough food to keep it alive. Clark's nutcrackers don't hibernate, but they also rely on white bark pine nuts and are very good at culling them out. Let's take a listen to some of the sounds of the Clark's nutcracker. Kind of a mournful call. Notice the all gray body with no markings on the head. Here's another high altitude near tree lined species of a jay that we have. This jay goes by several names the gray jay, also known as the Canada jay, or the whiskey jack. It's a little smaller than the Clark's Nutcracker. And notice instead of having just a gray head, this bird has a brown to blackish nape that comes up over it and touches the top of the eye and curls around down at the nape around towards the, the front of the bird's face. It has a white throat and white breast and then gray on the wings. Let's take a little closer look at the behaviors of the gray jay. There he is in a subalpine fur up at the high country in the Cascades. This is the bird that's frequently referred to as a camp robber by people, hikers, backpackers, and campers because they know people often mean three sources of food, either intentionally, like the peanuts that were thrown out for this day, or inadvertent drops of granola bars and food scraps from hikers having a trail site snack. 
the gray jay is only too happy to come right in and pick up those droppings and is not at all shy about being around people. A very beautiful bird. Doing what they do, hanging out in subalpine ferns, firs up near tree line. Here's some vocalizations of the great jay. Quite a vocabulary. When you up in the high country of the Cascades of the Olympics, look for both the gray jay and the Clark's nutcracker. That's their habitat that they occupy. Wow, look at this bird. This is our last of our corvids we're going to look at this evening. And the sun is hitting those feathers and the tiny oil droplets and water droplets and the feather barbules refract the light and give you a spectrum of medium to short wavelengths in the green, blue, indigo, and violet spectrum. And this gorgeous bird is the black-billed magpie. Let's take a look at a video of the black-billed black magpie that I filmed over in the Metau Valley in North Central Washington. Very inquisitive bird. Checking out what's inside the car. Anything good to eat? You see nice movements of the nictitating membrane, the third eyelid that all birds have. It closes from the inside of the eye by the beak towards the back, and it is a protectant for the eye. And it's clear so the magpie can see even when he's closing that nictitating membrane. If he gets into the sun, look at the beautiful colors, the refracted light through the wings. And let's hear what the magpie has to say. Quite a bit, I think. Magpies in our area in Washington State tend to be found east of the Cascade Crest, as were the location of the Metau Valley. They're a beautiful, beautiful bird to see when you're there. There's only one other magpie species that we have in North America. It's down in California, and it's the yellow-billed magpie that looks almost identical, except the bill and the skin around the eyes is a very bright yellow instead of black. Well, I want to uh, remind everyone that if you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to put them in the Q&A section. And if you're at your computer and at the end, we'll have a question and answer session and I'll try to get to your questions and do my best to uh, answer them for you. Well, now that we've identified the corvid species that we have here in Washington State, let's delve a little deeper into why this group of birds is smarter than your average bird. I mentioned at the beginning, Dr. John Marslop, professor at the University of Washington and a nationally and internationally recognized Corbett expert, author of many books, several PBS series. Um, I have a small excerpt here. This is Dr. Maslop talking about the intelligence of crows and showing an experiment of a crow solving a problem and then giving a nice example of the actual anatomy of a crow's brain in proportion to its body size relative to other creatures including us. So here's Dr. John Marslow. So first off, I want to start with a very short video clip. And in this clip, you're going to see a New Caledonia crow, not the species we have here in the United States, but one that lives on islands where there are no woodpeckers. And because there's no woodpeckers, there's a lot of food available underneath the bark and in the soil that an animal that would be clever enough to use something like a long tongue that a woodpecker has uh, could exploit. 
And the way the New Caledonia crow does this is to fashion tools out of stems of leaves and sticks to uh, skewer some of these uh, bugs that hide under these hidden places. So what you're gonna see is a, a film from colleagues at Oxford uh, that show a New Caledonia crow trying to solve a problem of getting a small basket of food out of a clear tube. And all Betty the crow is given here is a straight piece of wire. Not the sort of thing she's used to finding in her home uh, country of New Caledonia. So let's watch and see what she does. First off, she just grabs the wire and starts to use it and, and hoping that friction will help her and, and pull this basket up out of the tube. She's probing and pushing like she might use a stick to get, a, get an insect out of the bark, but it's not working very well. Friction's not helping her in this case. So now, think about what you would do. How would you solve this problem? How many of you would have thought of this? <laughs> Your small children wouldn't have thought of this solution to this problem, but the crow did. From that innovation, she's able to get food. Just making the tool itself is not all that amazing to me. That's what this animal does. In their native habitat, they regularly make tools and use them to procure food. But what surprises me in this video is that really, really she seems to have a plan. She seems to be using insight to solve this problem. She has steps figured out in her head. I'll try this, if that doesn't work, I go to the next set of sequences. Using insight or intuit to understand the nature of a problem and solve it is not something we used to think of animals as really doing, certainly not birds. So how do they do this? What allows them to do this sort of thing? Well, first off, uh, it's a function of their brain size, especially relative to their body size, and that's what this graph shows. On the y-axis, uh, you see the brain size of a variety of animals, and on the x-axis, the body size. And there are some lines there that represent general relationships between the size of the uh, animal and its brain. And big animals that Okay, well that video was truncated a little bit, um, but I can go on. I wanted to let Dr. Marslov explain a bit about crow brain size proportionate to body size because he's the real master of it. In essence, what he was going to continue on talking there was that uh, in the bird world, relative size of brains to body proportion, crows and ravens, jays all have, and, and magpies have very large brains and very complex brains. Um, their ability to uh, function very in ways very similar to humans is amazing. Um, as he talks about with his brain studies, crows can plan strategies, crows can dream, crows can undertake a course of action, stop, reflect on whether it's working or not, go back and try something else as we're gonna see shortly. And the thing that sometimes has given crows a bit of a, a, bit of a bad reputation, as I mentioned earlier, is that they're so intelligent, they're able to fulfill their basic hierarchy of needs, getting enough food, have been, having shelter, getting water, and they have all of this energy left over and the brain power to use it to have play activity. And many times that play activity involves making sport of other birds or animals uh, at, that, at that bird's expense. So that's where sometimes crows have gotten a reputation of being kind of a mean bird. They're just very in, incredibly creative. Um, their intelligence and their ability to have the energy to not just spend all of their time fulfilling basic survival needs means that they can function at a much higher order. When a crow dies, other crows will come around and have what are known as crow funerals. They'll all gather around their fallen comrade, you know, basically finding and gathering information about what possibly caused this crow to become deceased. Where in the hierarchy of the crow tribe was this crow? Is there a potential mate that this crow had that might now be available for another partner? Is there something that took the life of this crow that as the crow nation, we all need to be aware of? They're gathering information and it looks as though they're paying homage uh, to their fallen comrade. 
Um, there was a crow in Missoula, Montana that became, as I mentioned, these animals are all good mimics that was able to hear a man in his yard uh, calling his dog saying, come here, boy, here, boy, come here, and was able to replicate that sound and started calling a bunch of dogs. And he had a bunch of dogs on the University of Montana campus in Missoula that were coming because the dog would go to different yards and say, hey, boy, come here, boy, come on, let's go. And they all would gather in front of the campus. And then when students came out after class, the crow ran off and all the dogs were going, well, why are we all here? They thought their master was calling them. It was essentially the crow having fun. There was no purpose for this. The crow wasn't getting any food, wasn't getting any necessary survival needs for its life. It was just using its intelligence and using the energy it had left over from taking care of its basic needs to have some fun. There have been reports of crows that have been feeding on carrion on a highway. A car comes by, the car driver thinks they're gonna hit the crow. The crow ducks down close to the, to the asphalt, the car goes over it, crow pops back up. And then the crows start doing that with the different cars coming by, hopping down, getting down low and letting the car drive over them as though a sort of a, a game, sort of a risky game that they're playing. And I mentioned that earlier this evening as the sun was setting here in Seattle, the crows were riding a breeze, cruising and surfing the air. In Rocky Mountain National Park, they've taken it a step further. Ravens there pick up pieces of bark off trees, hook their claws into it, and use it as a surfboard. And they ride the updrafts, even though they're perfectly capable of doing so with their wings and their bodies and doing all sorts of acrobatic rolls and turns and twists, they're just having fun. They grab a piece of bark, use it as a surfboard, and kind of windsurf the air. So real signs of intelligence. The next video segment I have for you was from uh, some researchers in England that devised a very complex eight step puzzle for a crow to figure out to get some food. Let's take a look at how this crow did on this. All right. Can I stay in here? Absolutely, you can sit and watch. Right. And we'll see what happens. Come on then, send in your mastermind because it's gonna need that. Alex studies wild birds, which he releases after three months of research. This one is nicknamed 007, and it's about to attempt what Alex believes is one of the most complex tests of the animal mind ever constructed. The bird is familiar with the individual objects, but this is the first time he's seen them arranged like this eight separate stages that must be completed in a specific order if the puzzle is to be solved. And if the bird succeeds, it'll be a world first. He takes time to have a look and then starts with the short stick. Stage one. He finds it's too short to reach the food. He then sets off to get the first stone. But he drops it. Another. He seems to be stuck. But then, something seems to click. He deploys the first stone. And then another. Got it. The eighth and final stage.
success. Eight individual stages of one complex puzzle completed. That was remarkable. I've never, ever seen anything like it. Of all of the bird behavior that I've seen, nothing matches that. I can hardly believe it. I'm still just running that sequence through my mind. It happened really quickly. But the immediate question is, of course, how on earth did that crow do that? They are amazing. Crow language is equally complex and amazing. You know, we tend to think of crows just going, gah, 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 just kind of a raucous cawing sound. Dr. John Marsloff has been doing experiments for several years now with crow language and the ability of crows to communicate with one another. Several years ago on the University of Washington campus, he had some of his graduate students and he himself put on masks. One was a, a kind of a grisly, ugly caveman mask. Another one was a mask that was a, of a former Vice President Dick Cheney. Um, I don't know what there was some intent there or not. <clears throat> they captured some crows. Uh, captured and, and grabbed them and, and netted them. Crows didn't like being captured. And they recognized the faces of the masks when the people went out after they were released. They were released unharmed, but the crows recognized, had the facial recognition to know that when the caveman or the Dick Cheney appeared, that that was a person who was unfriendly to crows and crows would squawk and put up a fuss and react very aggressively. When the same people came out without the masks, Crows had no, no recognition, no effect at all. They even did an experiment where they put the mask upside down on the head and the crow still recognized that facial shape even upside down and reacted aggressively. And the thing that's even more incredible is that they were able to communicate to their offspring and not just their offspring the following season, but seven years later, crows that weren't even alive when this experiment was done, when the students would come out wearing the caveman mask, the crows would react the same way. So crows are somehow able to communicate to one another, <clears throat> people or other creatures that are friendly and positive in terms of their relationship to crows and other creatures that are not friendly and should be avoided or at least try to be driven out of the area. So crow language, way more sophisticated than we think it is. And crows are very social. Crows from the previous uh, nesting season will help out with raising of crows the next generation the following year. And crows roost communally. Just south of us, about uh, eight to nine miles is a big colonial crow roost. And we can see here at Seward Park Audubon Center every evening, rivers of crows by the hundreds flying south where they nest in a grove of trees. There's a hierarchy. The more higher social standing crows get the branches that are lower down and more secure, more out of the wind. Younger crows or crows with less social standing have to be in the upper branches where it's windier, maybe the branches and is sturdy to support them and they kind of have to keep resetting themselves. And once they're all there, they make a tremendous sound communicating, not just caw, 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 but all sorts of clicks and grunts and warbles and chatters and mutterings, an incredible array of sounds. I wish we knew what they were saying, but Dr. Marsloff's working on that because there's another crow roost at a University of Washington Extension campus in the city of Bothell, just to the Northeast of here. And luckily enough, the roof of the science building is adjacent to a woodland that has a crow roost in that area. So Dr. Marsloff has cameras and sound sensing equipment mounted on the roof of that building, videoing the crows and their behaviors and recording the sounds and running them through computers to see if we can make an algorithm to start to decipher the language of crows. So there's a lot going on in that crow's brain. I talked a bit about some of the examples of crow play. Let's take a look at some of them you'll see for yourself. These birds learn to have fun. What? <laughs> 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 
наверное, это Гатик Интересно, в какой стороне она сидит? Нет, она вообще не будет сидеть Мне едет со что-то Это не так же, как она сидит Так же, more like a puppy than a bird. So I think three things are quite apparent to you as you watch these crows and ravens uh, doing these behaviors. Number one, there was nothing in these behaviors that were essential survival skills for the birds. They were just seemed to be doing it to engage in play. Second thing, I think you'll notice that the play behaviors they did bore a remarkable resemblance to play behaviors that uh, we as humans like to do making snowballs, eating snow, rolling in the snow, enjoying it for the medium that it is. And very much like human children, when they're exploring play, they're learning about their world, they're learning about how their, their place in the world and about different substances like snow and how they react to it and how it interacts with them. So some very complex behaviors going on here. Dr. Marsloff in his studies has done, you know, hooked up crows to where they can see the different parts of the brain and how they're operating. And indeed, when the crows are playing or doing fun things like this, they're having endorphins released in their brain, just like when we do, when we do a pleasurable activity. So the crows are doing it, it's play, and they're getting the rewards of some endorphin release for, as a result.
This next video I'd like to show shows that we might tend to think of cats and birds as natural enemies, but uh, from in the Midwest back in the late 90s, this crow became friends and you might say adopted a small kitten, much to the surprise of the couple who had the cat for a pet. Let's take a look. That went out there both together eating the food. But the crow, he'd grab a mouthful and step back a couple inches and he'd gobble his ears up, you know. But then the cat, he keep on eating, the crow would come and grab another piece and take off. But he always made sure that the cat would eat his share. He won't get out of the road, will we, honey? They also discovered that the crow was very protective of the kitten. When they start crossing the road, the crow would holler, don't go in the road, you're gonna get hurt. Sometimes he'd get in front of it and kind of push her back to the sidewalk. He was protecting her, see? And because they, they were so friendly. And it's their unlikely friendship that comes across most vividly in the tape. For hours each day, they would tease, torment, and play with each other. <laughs> When Dr. Maimon and Jane Dash were finally shown the tapes, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. The bird was acting like the kitten's mother, you know, picking things off the grass and then putting it in the mouth. And the kitten, of course, play. Everything's play. So I think you can see clearly advanced behavior, play behavior, and transcending what we would tend to think of as normal birds. As John Marsloff always says, the term bird brain needs to be viewed in a completely different context. It doesn't mean small brained and not very intelligent. In the case of the Corvid family, it means high intelligence and behaviors that we tend to attribute more to primates and us human beings. So I hope this has given you a good overview of the Corvid family and in particular, how incredibly adept these birds are at advanced ways of thinking with their brains. So I'm happy to answer some questions if you have them. So like the young Stellar's Jay here, just shout them on out and I'll do my best to answer them for you. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Tell me leave questions in the chat box. You can leave your questions in the chat box as well, and I'll be happy to answer. Okay, so uh, someone wants to know why would Jays imitate hawks? So the question is, why would Jays imitate hawks? And I think it sounds like a facile answer and kind of a snarky one, but because they can. Um, they're not only mimic hawks, as I mentioned earlier, they can mimic human sounds. And crows, and particularly crows, have been known to speak words in German, speak words in English, like the one that was calling all the dogs in Missoula, Montana, to come hang out with it at the University of Montana campus. Um, I believe that there are a total of five different languages that crows have been able to speak and sound like a person speaking and understand the meaning of it. In terms of why a red-tailed hawk is probably one that can do it can do readily. Um, it may also serve red-tailed hawks when they give that call. It sometimes is an alarm call, and uh, it may be sending that call out as an alarm. In the bird world, birds are always concerned with being eaten by some other creature, particularly large birds eating small birds. So when a bird gives an alarm, many other birds will sound the alarm in the entire bird nation makes a variety of what we call alarm calls. Notes that are sort of t -t 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 or bish, 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 or in Stellar's J, bish, 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 a very raucous loud call. It may be that the Stellar's J is just imitating the red tail hawk call just to send out an alarm. We're not really sure why, but they're very adept. I have been fooled time and time again, even knowing that they're such good mimics. I'll hear a red tail hawk call, I'll look up in the air, no hop, I hear it again, they're on a branch as a Stellar's Jay. I kind of admit I don't mind being fooled because it's such a good mimic 
And these birds are so cool. What is the name of the membrane you referenced earlier in the time? Question was, what was the, the name of the membrane I mentioned earlier on birds' eyes? Birds have three eyelids, and the third one is called a nictitating membrane. N-I-C-T-I-T-A-T-I-N-G, nictitating membrane. It's a membrane that comes and crosses the bird's eye like this. Most birds have a clear one. Water birds use it like putting on a face mask to snorkel for fish. They close their nictitating membrane. It's like they put a face mask on and dive down and look for fish. For other birds like the uh, magpie that we saw, it's just a protective element that allows the bird to see without closing its actual opaque eyelids, but still protect its eye from dust, from other insects, from anything that's blowing that might injure the eye. The nictitating membrane. Um, are crows adapted for colder climates? Question is, are crows adapted for colder climates? Crows are very adaptable and live in a variety of climates. Uh, they are found all over North America, from down in the tropics, down in Mexico, around the Gulf Coast states, up the Atlantic seaboard, and then across Canada, across all the provinces, and up in Alaska as well. So they're very adaptable. They can live in hot climates, they can live in cold climates. So very versatile bird that can make a living anywhere. So the ones in cold climates probably have a little thicker layer of down underneath their feathers, but they do just fine in a variety of habitats. Let's see, how rare is it to see a magpie in Seattle? I had one near my home in South Seattle this summer. Question was, how rare is it to see a magpie in Seattle? As I mentioned, if you want to see magpies, it's best to go east of the Cascade Crest so you can see them in Ellensburg, in Yakima, in the Yakima Canyon, in the Wenatchee along the Columbia River, and in the Metau Valley. Um, occasionally, they are found west of the Cascades because birds go where they want to go, and particularly if there's food, they'll go there. Um, the best places you would see them in areas west of the Cascades are areas that are of uh, broad open grassland areas, which there aren't as many west of the Cascades, but there are some, such as down by Joint lewis mccord Base, uh, just south of Tacoma, over in some areas on the east side of the Olympic Mountains where it's a little bit of a rain shadow. And occasionally you do see them right around the Seattle area, but it's a bit of a rarity and they're such beautiful birds that when they do appear, they do attract a lot of attention. But if you really wanna see a magpie, go east to do your birding. Are crows or any of our other corvids uh, threatened by climate change? Question is, are crows or any of our other corvids threatened by climate change? And at this point, no, because these birds are so adaptable and so intelligent, they're able to deal with changes that come their way. And just as you saw the crows solving problems, multi-stage, even eight stages of solving problems, or in John Marsloff's example, bending the wire, to make a hook to get its food, they can figure out strategies and adapt to changing situations. Many other bird species though, are not that adaptable and able to do that. And as more birds move north with a warming climate, it displaces birds that are here regularly and forces them to find new areas. And you might just think that, well, why don't all the birds just get together and get along in peace? because there's limited food supplies. And when you have an influx of birds that aren't native in a particular area, there it can cause displacement and battles. Um, just in the human experience, think about when the Dust Bowl uh, storms hit the Midwest, the Southern Mid Midwest in the 1930s. How welcome were the, the, the Okies, as they call them, the poor farmers that had nothing left to farm when they came to California? Were they welcomed with open arms by the resident uh, inhabitants there, not so much. The same thing to a certain, a certain extent happens in the bird world. When more birds are influxing into an area where they haven't been, there's conflict. And uh, with the climate change being a reality, we may see more and more of that and more birds displaced and where they go and if they're able to survive is an open question. With the corvids though, and their intelligence level, they'll be able to adapt and figure out how to, how to survive. So how long do crows live? And also, is it okay to feed them? And if so, if it is, what should you feed them? 
How long do crows live? Crows can live into their 20s and even into their 30s. And what should you feed them? They love peanuts in the shell. So peanuts in the shell, they'll take some and eat them at the moment, but they'll also cache them, meaning they'll find a, a hidey hole spot, a crevice in the bark of a tree, a gutter, under a shingle perhaps, and stow it away for future use or poke it in the ground. They've got great memories for location. Um, the part of the brain, the hippocampus in the back of the brain that deals with sites and locations and memory of locations is very advanced in all of the Corbett family. So they can remember many, many, many different cache locations. So if you put out some peanuts in the shell, you'll see them eat some, but you'll see them take many of the shells and peanuts and store them away for future use. So that's what I recommend. And I get plenty of Stellar's Jays and now California Scrub Jays coming in for their peanuts as well. Um, how, long do, uh, how long do adult crows feed young crows that look full grown, but beg crows to be free to feed them? Well, in the bird world, young birds will keep begging for food as long as they get food provided by their parents. So through much of the summer, because most of our crows are hatching and fledging around the solstice, so June and July. And, but if they're not, it takes some skill to find your own food. So they'll continue begging. So all through July, you'll see what looks like full grown crows, maybe just slightly smaller on a branch next to an adult and just shouting in their ear, ha, 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 feed me, feed me, feed me. The adult will, but eventually in late summer, it arrives a point where the adults will quit feeding them and basically communicate to them, it's time for you to get out and make a living on your own. That being said, as I mentioned earlier, there is a social structure with crows and many times offspring of crows will hang around and be supportive of the family unit even into the next season when there's a new clutch of crows that hatch out. Different family members from previous years will uh, be around and help out. And right next to, near to us here at Seward Park, right on Lake Washington Boulevard, we have a beautiful crow that's not black at all. It displays a, a genetic uh, abnormality, a recessive gene trait that's called leucism, where not enough black pigment melanin is distributed into the feathers. And this bird looks like uh, a cafe latte or caramel. It's a beautiful caramel colored body with white swirls through it. It's a female crow because uh, she had offspring this year and I saw her feeding her offspring all through the early and mid part of the summer. The offspring were black crows, so they didn't have that recessive gene. They turned out with normal amounts of melanin in their feather pigments, but the mother crow is a beautiful caramel color. And uh, some people have named her Lucy for being leucistic. So there are variations in crows but they all hang out and help one another as the crow nation, even offspring from previous generations. Do the Seattle stellar jays migrate or did our jays get sick from the pine siskin eruption? Question was, do our stellar jays migrate? And was there any issues with uh, stellar jays being sick from last winter's uh, pine siskin uh, super flight? First answer to that question is most of our jays are resident and they stay around here. Although being very intelligent and very mobile, they move all around. They might move up into the mountains as the snow line recedes in the spring and feed up there. Although some will still hang around down here. Many of them as the snow is now starting to fall in the high country will come back down. So they move around a lot. If they find a regular food source like uh, a benevolent human that puts out peanuts in the shell for them, they will hang around. So they don't migrate like you might think of traditional songbirds heading south for the winter to Central America or South America. So most of them are in our general area. And the second part of the question was about the, um, the pine siskin. Oh, the pine siskins. Pine siskins in the boreal forests in Canada rely a lot on conifer uh, seeds, conifer cone seeds, like you saw the Clark's Nutcracker going for those white bark pine cones. Um, this last winter, many conifers in Canada had a, a crop failure, a seed crop failure, which happens from time to time. So they came south in what was known as a super flight. You know, thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of pine siskins, which are a type of finch, came much further south 
Now we have Pine Siskins that are residents here in Washington state as well, but we had a tremendous influx. Now, <clears throat> almost all birds carry salmonella. You know, chickens do. That's why when you buy a, a chicken at the grocery store, you need to wash it and prepare it before you cook it. But not all birds manifest the, the illness salmonellosis, the bacterial infections that result from salmonella. With this concentration of siskins that we had this last year coming to people's feeders, like mine, I put out seed feeders, um, they were able to transfer it. And since there were so many siskins, um, it was hypothesized that some of them uh, were weaker, might have been older, didn't have uh, the immune system at its working in its peak capacity to fend off salmonellosis. So many of the siskins were exhibiting swollen eyes, puffed up bodies, lethargy, looking obviously sick at feeders. So the advice, and it was good advice, was to take your feeder down, dispose of the seed, wash the feeder, you know, in a bleach solution, uh, one part bleach to 10 parts water, and keep the feeder out of circulation for a couple of weeks to those birds move on. Then put your seed back out, fresh seed in the clean feeder, and watch, monitor the birds that come there. If you saw more salmonellosis affected birds, take it in again. At my feeder, I didn't have any birds manifesting salmonellosis. So after consulting with a couple of uh, uh, bird disease specialists, actually three of them, they recommended that keeping the whole bird nation healthy and strong by having the feed for them out in winter was doing greater good than the potential of spreading uh, salmonella, which is probably many of the birds are carrying anyway. The salmonellosis was affecting probably the older, the infirm, um, the, the, the sick, uh, birds that weren't able to fend off because of depressed immune systems. So the jays and those birds, uh, I had no reports of anywhere of jays, crows uh, being affected by salmonellosis. Um, they tend to not be at the seed feeders as often picking out sunflower seeds. I would put out separate peanuts. So they had a separate food source and suet. Um, jays would love to peck on suet if you're having a suet feeder. Uh, I have not heard any reports anywhere of uh, jays or crows uh, having uh, salmonellosis. So I think we're safe there. Do you think that corvids are harbingers like salmon in terms of climate change? Question was, do I think corvids are harbingers of climate change, for example, like salmon? No, I don't think we can say that um, their harbingers are indicators of climate change. Other birds, particularly small songbirds, and by the way, the corvid family are considered songbirds. Passerines is the bird term, and it means perching birds. And we tend to think of perching birds, songbirds, like, oh, warblers and uh, vireos and the birds that migrate up from Central and South America and spend the summers up here. But corvids are perching birds. In fact, the raven is the largest passerine. No, I think their great adaptability means, as I mentioned earlier, they can survive in a variety of habitats from everything from deserts down in southern parts of North America and Mexico to up in Canada and Alaska. So they're very adaptable. And I don't think we can look for them as being a bellwether of climate change. There are other smaller songbird species that can though. And uh, we have been seeing evidence of that. Hermit thrushes, for example. Our backyard crows frequently bring us gifts such as dead moles or other food. Um, we're wondering why they do this. Because they're so smart, it's their way of thanking you. And there've been many examples of people that do nice things for crows, such as put out food, and the crows reward them by bringing back what they think is a little treasure. It might be a button, it might be a bead off a necklace that's been broken, it might be a piece of colored broken glass, it might be a wonderful dead rodent, <laughs> which to them they think, oh gee, here, let me give this to you. So based on the knowledge we have, they are just saying thank you and reciprocating your generosity by giving you a gift in return. Um, I haven't had that happen yet with the crows and jays in my backyard. Boy, I wish they'd get on it because I'd love to receive a little gift from them. But that's just their way of reciprocating and giving you a, tr a treasure in, in turn for you helping them. Pretty cool. Why do we think of magpies as hoarding things? Do other corvids have that behavior? 
As I mentioned, they all have a quite a developed hippocampus, which is the part of the brain that, that among other things, recognizes places and spaces and returns to those, can find their, find their way back to those places. So they stash food sources for use for when maybe food isn't as prevalent and they can remember many places, more so than many other birds. Clark's nutcrackers, they did an estimate, could remember something like 3,500, 3,500 different individual uh, cash sources for white bark pine seeds, like you saw in my video earlier where they're picking out the seeds. So they're very adept at having a variety of cash thoughts. So they cash and they stash and they can go back to them. So it's not just magpies, but crows and jays also do the same thing because of that well-developed part of their brain for spatial recognition and remembrance. So if they find something they like, they'll cash it. Is there any resources to learn about magpie language? My magpie buddy does a lot of chortling and chattering and I wish to, I could understand him. I wish I could too. The question was, is there any uh, resource for understanding magpie language? And you saw the magpie in my video just making a whole variety of sounds. And the question was from someone who has a magpie in his area that does the same thing. Um, Corvid language is a, a real mystery right now, but what we do know, as I mentioned, I think there's five different languages that crows have been able to speak in and they can imitate human voices, like saying, come on, come on, here boy, come on, calling dogs. Um, as I mentioned earlier at the University of Washington, they're doing, they have, they're taking advantage of the serendipity of having a crow communal roosting area right near the science building. And so they mounted uh, instruments on the roof, both visual and sound to record the different variety of sounds they make and visually the behaviors that the birds exhibit while they're making those sounds and run them through algorithms to try and figure out what is it that they're saying? I think our best guess right now is that it's much more complex than we can possibly figure out at this point, but hopefully with further research and new data and new ways of deciphering, we can figure out what they're saying, but it's certainly more complex than just a ka ka ka. There's a lot they have to say, and they're very adept at communicating that. As I mentioned earlier, even to generations seven years down the line, who's a friend of the Crow Nation? What face is an enemy of the Crow Nation? I wish I could give you more, but. There's a lot more going on. We just haven't been able to discover it yet. Do crows and raptors get along? Question is, do crows and raptors get along? I'll tell you, we had a Cooper's hawk nest, a small hawk, an occipiter that flies through the trees with great agility and typically preys on perching birds, songbirds, either snatching them out of the air or grabbing them when they're perched on a branch. So you would think that being a hawk that eats other birds, uh, other birds would be very wary of it. We have here this year, five Cooper's hawk juveniles that fledged and one or two of them I see regularly flying over our Audubon Center and they're playing with crows. First, you'll see the crow chasing the Cooper's hawk, then the Cooper's hawk's chasing the crow. They're looping up, doing circles over one another, landing in a tree together, vocalizing and then flying and circling, clearly exhibiting play behavior. And I talked, consulted with a man named Ed Deal, who was one of the hawk research experts in the United States. And he said, yes, in fact, Cooper's hawks do engage in play behavior with crows. I think it's again, the intelligence of the crow that it has lots of energy left over after sat satisfying its basic needs for life. It's very intelligent and is deciding hey, here's a playmate I can, I can have, you know, roll around in the air and have some fun with and get some good endorphins. Like the video with the, the crow and the cat becoming friends, a crow and a cooper's hawk becoming friends. When you're thinking of um, raptors being mobbed by crows, it's a fact that if you're a raptor, an eagle, a hawk, a falcon, an osprey, an owl, a kite, nobody likes you in the neighborhood, generally speaking. You're a big bird, you've got dangerous talons, and all other songbirds, whether they're crows or jays or even robins or blackbirds, will tend to try and drive you off, like, move along, move along. We're not comfortable with you in this neighborhood. You're too dangerous. So you'll see what's called mobbing behavior. 
crows and jays and blackbirds and robins swooping, say a perched eagle or a perched owl and trying to drive them off all the while squawking and carrying on a tremendous fuss. It's a great way to find a raptor because if you hear the crow nation going crazy, kicking up a ruckus, go out and see if you can see what's going on, you might see an owl or an eagle. So in general, all birds try to move a perching raptor often into the, out of their area. But in some specific cases, raptors and crows can be playmates. So that's the answer to that question. And Ed, are you familiar with Hollow Kingdom, a book called Hollow Kingdom? Uh, the question is, am I familiar with a book called Hollow Kingdom? And no, I am not. I may be missing out on something, but I can certainly look it up. So thank you for the reference. So it is zombie apocalypse uh, <laughs> in Seattle from a crow's point of view. Ah. <laughs> and a couple of people have mentioned it here. Oh, OK. <laughs> zombie apocalypse in Seattle from a crow's point of view. No, but I will mention a, a great book called Raven's End by a, a Canadian naturalist named uh, Ben Gad that takes a look at a story of a raven named Colin who falls off a climbing wall in uh, uh, the Canadian Rockies. And the whole book is about his life and illustrating great facts of the natural world of corvids through, the, through this bird named Colin. So Raven's End by Ben Gad. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me this evening. I appreciate uh, having you join and all your questions. And I hope it gives you a little bit of appreciation. Crows aren't just raucous, squawky birds creating problems. They're actually very intelligent and living a life, exhibiting a lot of behaviors that are similar to you and I. So enjoy our Corbett family, and thank you. And if you'd like to continue to ask uh, Ed questions, please continue to put those messages in the chat room. And when Ed can get a few minutes aside, hopefully he can get back to you and answer those questions. So thank you all for joining us. And by the way, uh, it does say Joseph Manson on there. Well, this whole time it was actually Ed Dominguez as your host and a brilliant scholar on all things natural world. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>